The ring buffer is one of my favorite data structures. It's used all over the place, like in this Wikipedia diagram that shows a keyboard buffer where keys are being typed by the user, and then on some interval, it actually gets read by this red arrow and sent to a target device. Now, we're gonna be looking at a more modern case of this today around sensor information, but we're going to talk about just the design of the data structure as a whole, what the implementation might look like in this case in Go, and hopefully you'll leave this with an appreciation for this data structure and some ideas of how you might use it should that come up in your future. Shortly, we will be coding this up as a brand new Go project, but let's first talk about a use case where this could be applicable. So let's pretend for a moment that we have a problem where we're taxed with getting sensor information from multiple low powered sensors, and we need to eventually get this into a database. Now, often when you look at cases like this, you might realize that having many of those connections from the low powered device is not a great architectural decision. Additionally, just hitting the database with an insert for every sensor read might not be feasible. So what we have to think about is a potential model with a co-located emitter. And this co-located emitter will take in information and then provide some output to the database on an interval like every 30 seconds. The final thing to think about when we come to the conclusion that we need this kind of buffer emitter model is oftentimes what should our maximum batch size be if we're on a timed interval? So, you know, we probably don't want to hit the database with 17 days of information in one batch. We want to have a max, like 100, 1,000, whatever the right number is. And if we set that constraint of the batch size, we then need to think about what should we do if we have sensor data that enters when the size is reached. If it's reached, should we try to page out old information, persist it, maybe send it at a different time, and so on? And this might be a requirement for you, but a lot of times we come to this conclusion that we don't want to deal with these more complex constructs, like in the case of back pressure, where we try to think about how we can adjust routing and input based on telling other parts of the system that it needs to slow down. Instead of worrying about that level of complexity, we might just commit to the idea that the most up-to-date signal from those sensors is the most important thing in our use case. It's certainly unideal to have data loss, but it's just way better to keep it simple and get the most up-to-date info. Our solution design ends up looking something like this, where we have multiple sensors collecting info, sending it to the buffer, and that buffer is sending it to the data store. But the question, of course, is, what is this buffer? How is it implemented? And we know from that diagram on the keyboard that it's supposed to be kind of like this ring-like construct. Now, the good news is if we think about this for a moment, the design is pretty simple using just an array where the key thing here is that if we had an array, let's say it's an array of size three, so we've got our different indexes inside of here, zero, one, and two, what we want to be able to do is we want to ensure that if we ever go next from the index two, right, or the index two being the length of the array minus one plus one is kind of like a way to think about this operation, right? So effectively, in our case, this would be index two plus one. We want to somehow make it so that this ends up equaling zero. So we wrap around the array and end up with a pointer or whatever we're doing, you know, one of these red or blue arrows we looked at earlier, sitting at the zero position so that we can potentially write or read from that. So keep this kind of redirection in mind as we get into the implementation, and we'll look at some cool tricks that you can do in almost any programming language to implement this model. Time to implement. As I mentioned earlier, we have an empty Go file with just a Go mod, and I'm going to start a main.go file here. This will be inside of package main, and we're gonna start off with setting up the ring buffer structure. So the type here is going to be a ring buffer, and then this ring buffer is going to be a struct, and this struct will, of course, hold multiple fields. The first internal field that it's going to have is the data itself. So we're going to keep this as a slice with a pointer to a data struct or object that we will be defining a bit later. On top of data, we're going to have the size. And the size is just going to be a way for us to internally specify what the size of that buffer should be. There's some optimizations this will do in kind of the Go side for the array allocation and so on. We'll get to that in a bit. And then we're gonna keep track of the last 
insert we did, so last insert, which will be an integer, and the next read that we did as well, also an integer. So you can kind of think of these as pointers to where in the array we sit. And since this is going to be a time-based model, although I probably won't be implementing time in this exact video, we'll just set it up to have it. So emit time could be like a time.time .time that the user specifies and allows us to, you know, say 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and so on. So when we effectively look at the ring buffer kind of from a visual standpoint, what we know that we have here is we've got this data structure data, and this is our underlying array. And we know that we're going to keep track of our insertions and our reads. So reads are probably going to start here. So NR for next read, and we'll have zero, three, two, and then this will be an empty one at the very end. And we know that last insert is going to track what the last insert is in here. And keeping these in mind and knowing that we're tracking them will be crucial to our emit logic and even to a degree our insert logic as we get deeper. Now, I also mentioned that inside of this ring buffer structure, I have a data field. So let's implement that as well. We'll bring this up a little bit here so you can see it. And we'll call this the data struct. And data struct is really just a holder of some small values. The data structure is going to have a stamp, which will be time.time .time inside of it. And then we're also going to have a value, and the value is going to be a string. Whether we keep track of the time of the insertion is going to be kind of up to our implementation, but it'll be cool to kind of make fake sensor info with, with a time attached to a potential arbitrary value, which we'll represent as a string. Next, let's implement the constructor for this ring buffer. So I'll send this a little bit higher. And we will do a func, and this will be a new ring buffer. And this new ring buffer is going to be specified as a certain size. We are going to emit, again, that time piece just to keep this simple for now. And it's going to return a pointer to a ring buffer. All right, so what we can do here is we can set up the address of that ring buffer and we can fill the struct to kind of initialize some of the key values. So here are some of the key things that we're going to want to consider in the initialization. The first thing we know is that we actually know the size. So in Go, there's a bit of a benefit that we could do by pre-allocating the size of this slice. Slices are kind of like vectors or lists by saying that we want to make data and we want to specifically make data of the size, okay? And again, it's a very, very small optimization, but how Go slices work, like a lot of libraries, it's going to pre-allocate a certain underlying array, and then as you hit the limit of that, it will grow it and grow it, which is going to require new allocations. This will just omit that since we are at a fixed size. Next read is going to start at zero, which is also the default value for integers in Go, but for last insert, we are going to specify a value here, which will be negative one. So this will be a way for us to identify identify when no inserts have occurred. A second an insert occurs in the life of this ring buffer, this should never be negative one again. And as I mentioned, the uh, emit or the emit timing, if you will, is something we're going to not worry about right now. So this is a perfect ring buffer constructor that we can call to create a ring buffer. The insert function is going to be implemented to add an API for bringing new items into that ring buffer. So once again, I'll bring this up and this is going to be a func. It is going to be a method which is going to be attached to the ring buffer itself. So let's attach that to ring buffer and we're going to call this insert. Insert is going to take an input which will be of course the type data. And we don't actually need to do a return here because it's just going to be this insert that happens. Now, here's where we're going to calculate where to insert in the ring buffer. You might remember that we have an understanding of the last insert and next read. So the first thing that we want to do, and kind of this tricky piece I was alluding to earlier, is that we are going to say that r dot last insert equals the r dot last insert plus one. So this actually works even if last insert is set to negative one, right? Because plus one will start us at index zero. If for some reason our last insert was at zero and so on, it would just increment perfectly. Now, of course, the problem that this is going to create for us is that if we're at the end of the array, it's going to go out of bounds when we hit that plus one. So the little trick that we're going to be doing throughout this exercise is to actually modulo against r dot size. So if you think about what this is going to equate to, pretend you 
have an array and the length of that array is five. So if you're doing an operation where you say, okay, so last insert is three, three plus one, equals index four. That's a perfectly valid operation, right? And if you add a modulo in here for this, so we'll do percentage sign um, length, or I guess percentage side five in this case, and you do need to worry about kind of your PEMDAS order of operations thing. So three plus one modulo five is still going to equal four. So you're still going to get that same plus one operation. But the great thing about this trick is if we were at the end, so we were actually at four and we moduloed to five, what this is going to end up being is five. 5 modulo 5, which is going to equate to 0. So that is effectively the trick here, where when we hit the end and do the plus 1, as long as the modulo is there, we're going to guarantee to wrap back into index 0. So a neat little trick. We're going to be using this throughout the rest of the implementation. So we've got r.last insert set and good to go. Let's now look at r.data and we will do r.last insert. So we've kind of preemptively moved the last insert up and now we're going to use this as the place that we put the input. Since it is a pointer, we're gonna do a reference to the input value. And then the last thing we need to do when we do this insert is check to see where was next read relative to this last insert. So if we do r.nextread equals equals R dot last insert. The key here is we want to ensure that if last insert reached the next read, that we move next read forward. So I'll continue programming this and then maybe we'll just kind of draw it out to make sure that we're all on the same page. So if next read equals equals last insert, all we're going to do here is check to increment the next read. Next read needs to do the same looping principle. So if we do R dot next read, plus one, and then we do the modulo once again and access r.size, this is going to be the correct calculation for next read. Now let's think about this logic a little bit here in case it's hazy for anybody. So if we were to put out our buffer for just a moment, let's pretend we are in that case where the buffer is completely filled up. So we've got an array, it's again our buffer, which is of size three. And let's pretend for a moment that we have values in here, three, six, and seven. Now, next read is starting at zero, which is where it should be. So NR, right, is going to be at zero. It has not read anything yet. And then what happened at seven is we've got last insert setting here, right? LI is to seven. Now let's imagine for a moment that LI moves over. So we're going to pop back here and we're going to pretend that LI overwrote this three and made it an eight. So now LI has reached this point in the array. Now what's the problem here? Well, the issue is that next read shouldn't be eight. Think about it, eight is in fact the latest value. So we really want next read to always be pointing at the oldest value inserted to start from there from the admission. So this is when these two are equal as we did our expression, we effectively want to take next read and move it one index up or wrapped around if we were at the end of the array. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. We basically want to keep next read in front of that last insert pointer. With insert in place, we're ready to implement the emit logic. So this will be the last method on the ring buffer. We'll bring this up here so it's easier to read, and we will, instead of insert, call this emit. Now, emit is not going to take any parameters. It's just going to be an emission call. An emission is going to return a list of these pointers to the data objects. So to start us off here, we're going to start by capturing the output that we will collect as we iterate through. This is going to allocate a new slice of data. Now, do note that this has some memory overhead, of course, but these are pointers to the data object. So for the most part, it should be minimal for us. With this in place, we're now ready to start looping through and figuring out what we want to pull out of the ring buffer. And as a kind of visual representation here, this is quite close to the idea. Obviously, ours is time-based. And unlike this example, we talked about how the red right pointer should be able to overwrite existing things if new things were to come up. Regardless, it'll be a pretty simple for loop for us to put together. Now, what we're going to be doing here, and it'll be a little more obvious later, is we're going to first check to see if the R data at next read 
is filled up. So since we have these arrays or lists of pointers to data, they can in fact be nil. So if they don't equal nil, we are going to capture them into the output. So the output then becomes this command where we want to append to that output, that data array will be returning, and we're going to specifically append the r.data next read. So we will open this up, it will be the next read, and then that object is going to get appended inside of here. And we'll clean this up by just say, specifying that we will be returning that output once we are all done. And this will be r.nextread, because remember, next read is part of the read uh, ring buffer. So now we're appending this in and capturing it. All of that looks pretty good. And once we have read it, what we're going to do, and this is maybe a bit of a design choice you'd want to think about, we're going to take that r.data at the r.nextread, so r.nextread, and we are going to set this to nil. So this will kind of clean out of that data structure, the nil object, and it keeps it clean, helps with debugging, but could have some like memory overhead doing garbage collection. Like there are ways to implement this where you just never clean stuff out and just continue to overwrite existing data, but that has some trade-offs too. So we're just gonna keep it simple for cleanliness sake and set it to nil. Now, once we have gone through and we have checked if next read isn't nil and whether we need to append it, we then need to check to see if next read equals equals r dot last insert. Okay. Now, if next read equals r dot last insert, this is where we want to break out of the array because what we've done is that we have effectively gotten to the last inserted element. There's nothing else that has been inserted for us to deal with. So we will break out of the for loop here. Again, this for loop has no conditions, as you can kind of see here. I'm trying to keep it all in frame. Sorry for jumping around. Let's get it right there. So the for loop has no conditions. This is going to be our break condition. And actually, as one more condition we should handle here, we should actually say, or if last insert equals negative one, because remember, we started the last insert value out and the constructor is negative one. So if for some reason emit gets called and there is no data because last insert is negative one, we need to just pop out right away and break this loop because there's really nothing for us to send out, all right? So we have got the condition for adding things in, we've got the break condition if we've reached last insert, and then of course if we get down here because we have not reached last insert, the last thing we wanna do is increment next read. So you probably could guess where this is going. We're gonna do that same operation we did before where we gather what would be r.nextread read plus one, but of course we need to have that wrap around. So we're going to do the percentage sign and we will do R dot size to ensure we get this. So I will, I see my head is blocking this a bit. Let me drop it down there. Now you can see this kind of expression here. So this is the entire function. Let's make it smaller so you can see it. Great. And then let's just make sure we're super clear as a last step on everything that's happening. So emit is going to get called probably based on some timer, right? We know that it is going to return the data, and this data is going to be captured over time in this output thing that we're calling. Now the for loop, as mentioned, is conditionless. So the for loop is going to continue until next read reaches last insert. That represents that we've read everything at this point in time that has been inserted. As we're going through, assuming that next read is not sitting over top of a nil value, we are going to add to that output and we are going to set next read once read into a nil value so that we can clear it out. Assuming we did not reach the end, we are once again going to move next read up, which is either going to be incremented by one or wrapped around if we were at the last element. And then, of course, as a very, very final step, that output that we accrued, we are going to return that as well. So now we've got our logic in place here and we're looking pretty good. It does look like we have a small error somewhere. Oh, last insert. That's my bad. This needs to equal equal negative one, an equality check, not an assignment check. But otherwise, the logic looks great. And this should do our mitts, and this should do our inserts. Now I think we're ready to write a simple main function that tests this out. 
For main, I'll go to the bottom of the file as usual and make sure that I type up here so my face isn't blocking it. And we will do a func of main. This is just a standard main function to kick off our package. And for main, we are going to capture a ring buffer using our ring buffer constructor. We'll set it at size five. And we'll start off with just a simple use case where we print out an empty test. So effectively doing an emit when nothing has been filled into the ring buffer. We want to make sure that works. So this will be an empty test. And after the empty test, I'm actually going to be using a package called spew. Spew has a function called dump. And while my head's blocking it a bit, the great thing about dump is it will take whatever you give it. It'll follow pointers. It'll dereference them. And it'll give you a full text output of everything known inside of that data structure. So we are going to dump what rb.emit returns. And that will be a great first test for us. So I'll just cancel out while we're here. And let's do a go run of main.go. And you can see that empty test returns an empty set of data. That's exactly what we'd hope for in the case of zero insertions. So let's go back into main and let's implement some insertions. So what we'll do to do some insertions is I'm going to just kind of capture the alphabet to increment over the letters in the alphabet. So we can do this with runes in Go. This will kind of respect the ASCII table and the values that underlie it. So we'll start with A. And I don't know what comes before A, so let's just start with A minus minus one, and I will eventually be incrementing current rune as we insert things in. So we're gonna do a simple for loop here, and what this for loop will do is initialize a variable to zero, and we'll do 10 iterations here. So while i is less than 10, i plus plus, and inside of this, we're gonna start off by incrementing current rune. So current rune will start off at the letter A in the alphabet as we get going. And we're gonna do an rb.insert using our API, and this will grab the data. And the data struct is going to have two fields inside of it, stamp and value. For the stamp, I think the easiest thing we could do is time.now, which is going to be like a sensor giving a read at a current time. And then for value, we're just going to take the string representation of the current rune and that will be what we gather. So you'll notice that I chose 10 here, and the reason I chose 10 is I'm actually hoping that this is going to be overwritten as we get deeper. The example that I'm sort of thinking about here is that we know that we've got A, B, C, D, and actually, we won't even worry about E just yet. Let's pause on E. Actually, no, we'll, we'll, we'll capture E. So we know it's of size five. Fair. So since it's of size five, at some point the ring buffer is going to be filled with A, B, C, D, E. Now, when we go in and increment or do another insert, what we'd expect here is for F to take over A and then the values of B, C, D, and E to remain the same. And then we increment again and B will get erased and so on and so forth. And of course, as we talked about, next read should be kind of moving in front of last insert as we circle back around here. And the final end state that I think we should expect is to be in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J per the alphabet. So our end result when we admit the thing that we're expecting is F, G, H, I, J. And let's see if we get just that. So we are going to capture kind of the same output from before this value was, oops, did I let's see if I can bring that value back? There we go. So we'll copy this empty test from before. And then outside of the loop, let's do a full test. And the full test will just run an emit once again. So we'll save this up. We will do go run main.go. And the output got a lot going on, but hopefully you can kind of see some of the key values here. Actually, that will capture it for you right there. Let's look at these. So we have got F through J. So F, G, H, I, J. This is that ring buffer, rewrapping around, calling emit, and then read is just going through from zero all the way to the end and returning these values to us. Wrapping up, there are a couple things that are worth pointing out. First off, this algorithm slash data structure is doing nothing to consider our needs around thread safety. So if we did take it a step further and do that time-based emit, we probably want to consider some type of mutex or something so that insertions aren't coming in while we're attempting to do the emits. Additionally, we might even want to consider something like that for insertions. If multiple sensors might be coming in, perhaps through like an HTTP handler that could be firing off on different go routines and inserting data. 
Another thing that I wanted to mention is that if you find this expression quite ugly, this kind of clever calculation that we've been doing, well, what we could do is we could have actually attached a type instead of int to, let's go back into our browser here and let's, or our terminal, and let's do main.go. Instead of using ints for last insert and next read, we could have introduced a new type, something like type index struct, right? Or actually type index int. And what type index int would have allowed us to do is to put these as this type that is effectively an int. And we'd be able to attach methods to it. Specifically, we could have in theory attached a method that represented next. So instead of calling this, again, kind of ugly calculation from an API standpoint, we could have said last insert dot next. And it could have wrapped this functionality, kind of creating a bit of an abstraction for the reader of the code or people using this, I suppose. I also mentioned earlier that emit is setting values to nil. This does have potentially some overhead, but I think it's going to be pretty small. We're probably only concerned about premature garbage collection uh, from these values when we wouldn't normally have to do it. But generally speaking, I, I think this is probably fine. And then the last thing I'll call out is that Go has a ring package. Now, the ring package is actually quite different than what we implemented. They're using, I believe, like a linked list that is kind of pointing to these things so the ring could, in theory, grow. Uh, you know, that has trade-offs, like the idea that it's less contiguous memory, there's pointers flowing, it might not end up in a CPU cache. And they also have some extra APIs for like joining rings together and stuff. It's It's been a while since I've looked at this package, but it does kind of approach the problem a bit differently. Nonetheless, it's in the standard library. So if you want to check it out, see if it meets your needs. Nonetheless, whether you implement this or use their ring package, I hope you found this kind of interesting. You know, I think the cool thing about this data structure is that it allows us to look at really simple primitives and know that just small modifications around them can allow us to solve real world use cases, which I find really fun and interesting. So happy building and I'll catch you in the next video.